Hello and welcome to another session on uh, Islamic finance um, with ABIQ and I'm as always delighted to have with me with the Ishmael Desai um, and I'm going to introduce him or get, hand it over to him the microphone to introduce himself as well as uh, um, the GIFS and then maybe just immediately get things underway. Um, Ishmael, I'll start the presentation as well and then you can continue. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Emil, and the esteemed management of uh, ABIQ. Always a pleasure to conduct our sessions on Islamic finance and economics. And um, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the esteemed participants of this august and momentous occasion in terms of the presentation on Islamic finance concepts of project financing and infrastructure financing. Uh, together with that, I would like to provide you with a quick overview of today's session in terms of the format of today's session. So essentially, we would have a brief presentation outline in terms of the credentials of global Islamic financial services and a, an introduction to the concepts of Islamic finance we will then also discuss specific aspects around the concepts of sukuk, uh, Islamic bonds, and how to raise Sharia compliant capital from the Islamic capital markets. And thereafter, we will have a brief question and answer session for the participants of this event. So if you do have any questions in the interim, there is a Q&A tab on, on the top. Please do not hesitate to post your questions. Um, and if we do not answer any, any of your questions during the session, then please uh, leave your details um, and we will respond to you uh, via email. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to begin today's session um, entitled Islamic Project Financing Concepts, uh, Global Islamic Financial Services Firm with GIFS and ABIQ. Um, next slide. So as we discussed, we will discuss the a brief introduction to Islamic finance some of the concepts and thereafter we would go on to things like sukuk, Sharia governance, and how to raise Sharia compliant capital. Uh, and thereafter we will have a Q&A session. Next slide. So what are some of our credentials? So we have been involved in the Islamic finance industry for the past uh, decade. And we currently advise the Ethica Institute of Islamic Finance, Infinity Consultants, Botswana Life Insurance Limited, which is the largest insurer in Botswana, Hijaz Financial Services, which is the largest Islamic financial services provider in the Australasia region, um, uh, the Center for Advanced Islamic Economics, and we advise various governments and central banks on Islamic finance. And lastly, I am the founding director of the Russian Islamic Finance Council uh, under the leadership of the Global Islamic Financial Services Firm, which has close to 75,000 members. Uh, next slide. So some of the Islamic financial services products that we've developed over a period of time include the first ever Sharia compliant wildlife fund for the South African market. We've issued hundreds uh, of fatawa or Islamic legal edicts on Islamic finance and economics. We've also conducted Sharia training for hundreds and thousands of bankers globally. And we've advised various governments on uh, Sharia compliant uh, structures, including the Chinese government on a Sharia compliant energy project worth $150 million. And we've advised various banks uh, and institutions globally. Uh, next slide. Um, next slide. So these are some of the award-winning and landmark deals that the GIFS has conducted. So for the Dubai Municipality Sukuk, Al Khabir Reed Fund, Istismar Capital Reed Fund, Shua Capital, uh, GLFL Morabaha Syndicated Finance, the Global Ethical Fund based in Australia, the Avani uh, Halal Hotel and Resorts based in the United Arab Emirates, uh, Sharia currency trading and forex transactions out of the London Metal Exchange. Uh, next slide. Uh, so these are some of the groundbreaking products and structures that we've developed. As you can see, a Morabaha stock leveraging product based out of the UAE uh, and the US, a Sharia factoring product based on Salam based in South Africa, a hybrid Takaful product based in Botswana, a Beitul Mal structure based in South Africa, a, a Sharia compliant crowdfunding, Sharia compliant biological wildlife vehicle, etc. Next slide. So uh, this is an executive background in terms of GIFS. We offer the end-to-end -end Sharia corporate advisory services, investment and wealth management, corporate and investment banking solutions, 
So essentially, if you have a bond to issue, we, we'd be able to raise the capital, uh, structure the product, et cetera. Uh, we, we also issue wholesale and business finance, and we also do corporate tax audit and legal advisory services and solutions. Uh, our track record, as you can see, 100% profitability in all our investment portfolios, where we have a unique uh, risk management software that uh, is currently used by 500 of the world's most influential banks and institutions. Um, we have close to $4.5 billion of AUM, uh, $8.2 billion in deal advisory, and we advise various central banks, uh, financial institutions uh, globally. Next slide. Next slide. So this is our motto, embracing Islamic finance through Sharia compliance, achieving new heights in expansion and growth. So essentially, we believe that Islamic finance is a new paradigm for Islamic finance, and it will propel uh, the global Islamic economic system to a more just and economic system. We have two forms of uh, economic systems. We have the socialist or capitalist, and we have the Islamic economic system. So Islam, the Islamic economic system is based on one aspect of the life of a Muslim. Uh, and Islam, we believe, is a complete way of life. It is not only about praying at the mosque, uh, in, you know, and it is not only confined to the four walls of the mosque. Islam is a complete way of life, and that also includes how we interact financially and economically with the world. When it comes to socialism and capitalism, these are entire concepts that are man-made and not divinely guided. So hence, there obviously would be challenges when it comes to these systems. And if you look at uh, you know, the, what is touted as the Great Economic Reset, this simply proves that capitalism is not sustainable as it has created a concentration of wealth in the hands of, a, of, a, of the super wealthy. As they say, a concentration in the, ha in the hands of the 1% of the wealthiest and elite people globally. Or if you look at the socialist system, the socialist system seeks to allocate resources by the political bureau or, or by the Politburo to its uh, citizens uh, based on its own economic rationale and not based on, on divine guidance. And the socialist system, we all know, has to failed totally um, because it is a man-made system and it doesn't work. So the only system that has stood the test of time is the Islamic economic system. And when the global financial crisis hit in 2008, and also uh, when COVID hit, most of the Islamic financial institutions, I would say, you know, 99.9% .9 of Islamic financial institutions uh, were not adversely affected by the COVID uh, impact or by the uh, COVID pandemic. So going to Islamic infrastructure and project funding, uh, what is the definition of infrastructure and project financing? The financing of an economic unit with the underlying cash flows to service the economic unit in association with collateral. So essentially, Sharia compliant project infrastructure projects would include oil projects, mining projects, gas projects, roads, hospitals, etc. The Sharia compliant financing techniques would include syndication, where you could use the Musharaka and Mudaraba partnership concepts, uh, bridging, um, securitization, where you could use the Suku concept, or direct financing, where you could use the Istisna concept um, via what is called a build and operate transfer uh, mechanism or concept. Now, there are different hype classes of the infrastructure funding. You get the fixed income, hybrid, and equity. And some of the Sharia compliant vehicles include Suku funds, listed and unlisted infrastructure funds, infrastructure ETF funds, etc. So there are a number of these funds, listed or unlisted infrastructure funds that could be used. Some of the key concepts here include Mudaraba, Wakala, Ijara, Kafala, Murabaha, and Istisna. Now, I will briefly explain this to you before going into more details of these concepts. So if you look at the Mudaraba, Mudaraba is a sweat equity concept. In other words, that one party contributes the capital and the other party contributes the sweat equity. So under a Mudaraba partnership, um, the profits could be based on an agreed ratio, based on a mutual agreement, and the losses are only borne by the capital provider and not by the Mudarib or the sweat partner. And then if you look at Wakala, Wakala refers to agency or the concept of agency where you have the Wakil and you have the Mwakil. The Mwakil is the principal 
and the wakil is the agent. Now, this works in the instance where the government would depute a third party, for example, to procure goods, etc. This is termed as wakala. That, then you have the concept of the ijara, which is essentially where you have uh, the project provider or the promoter that leases the asset um, from the investors. So in other words, the investors would develop the infrastructure asset and then lease it to the government over a fixed term. And at the end of the term, the government would then purchase that asset for a nominal sum. An example of this, let's say the government of South Africa intends to fund or develop a 100-kilometer road. That road would cost a billion dollars. So investors would then develop the road and then they would lease that road to the government under the Ijara concept. Now, at the end of the term, obviously it's not the intention of the investors nor the government that, they, that the investors would own that road for time eternity. The investors would, at the end of the term, say, we have invested a billion dollars, but over the term, we have made a profit of, let's say, $500 million. And at the end of the term, the project is then sold out to the government. So the government has paid its lease, and the investors have made a profit. And at the end of the term, the government benefits through, the, through ownership of the asset. So that is what is termed as the Ijara concept. Then you have the Murabaha concept, which is basically where the, an asset is sold where the cost price is also known to the buyer and the seller, obviously. So an example of this is, let's say, for example, the government of Egypt intends to set up a wind farm. So they would then depute the project promoter to then purchase the wind farm or the, or the wind, or wind turbines for a fixed term. The promoter would then purchase it and then sell it to the government of Egypt for a fixed markup. So that would be an example of a Murabaha financing or cost plus financing structure. And then you have the Istisna structure. The Istisna structure refers to what we term commonly as the build, operate, transfer model. In other words, that let's say the government of the United States instant, intends to build a 500 kilometer road in the, in the United States, but it doesn't have the funds. So the government would then say that we are then deputing a, an EPC contractor or a, manufact, or, a, or a contractor, a building contractor to then produce the road. That would be an istisna contract because the uh, government cannot purchase the roads. They have to appoint a third party to develop the roads. So therefore, the third party, which is the building manufacturer, would then develop the road and then they would then hand it over to the investors who would then unlease it to the government over a term. They would make a profit and then uh, sell it for a nominal sum to the government. So that's an example of an istisna uh, contract. Or what is termed as a manufacturing contract, etc. The security, the security could be based on a common security pool or what is called a kafala or a third party guarantee. Some of the key issues when it comes to Islamic project funding, including the issue of default. So if there is a default that occurs in an Islamic project funding mechanism, what happens in that instance? So generally you would find that there would be a fixed jurisdiction in terms of the uh, project funding, in terms of the jurisdiction, and that jurisdiction would then be able to decide over matters from an Islamic finance perspective, etc. So generally, we advise that an arbitration clause be inserted into the contractual agreements so that if there are any disputes, then they are arbitrated or mediated on an Islamic basis. Then the second issue is in terms of tax. So from a tax perspective, not all jurisdictions have tax parity from an Islamic finance and economic perspective. So hence, we advise um, you know, practitioners, we advise project promoters of projects to seek the right tax advice in terms of ensuring that there is proper tax neutrality and parity with conventional tax laws in terms of their structures that they intend to execute. Thirdly is in terms of the hedging mechanism. Now, Sharia, Sharia finance or Islamic finance allows for Sharia swaps, cross-currency swaps. Generally, you would find third world countries, for example, issuing euro bonds on the basis of USD. In other words, that in this instance, 
the euro bond would then be issued on the basis of a US dollar in foreign currency uh, and not on the local currency of that, uh, uh, of that issuer, which is the state government. For example, the Egyptian government would issue a USD bond listed on the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Now that would create an issue in terms of the difference between the Egyptian pound and in terms of the USD. So the government would then have to hedge against the currency fluctuation. So they would, they would then purchase what is called a Sharia compliant cross currency swap. Uh, the next important point is in terms of intercreditor agreements that has to be Sharia compliant and there would have to be a proper Sharia audit or Sharia governance trail in terms of the project. Because the Sharia institutions that would invest like Sharia pension funds, Sharia uqaf, Sharia endowments, uh, Sharia equity funds, etc., they would need to ensure that their Sharia boards are happy with the Sharia governance of that structure or that project. Now let us look at some examples of Sharia project funding that have taken place in the past decade or so. So you have Aldar Properties that issued a Sukuk, Emirates Airlines, we were involved in that project. Um, Dinklaters were the legal advisors on that project. And essentially they use what is called the uh, title uh, or the legal title of the time that would be spent in terms of the flying time for the passengers. And they uh, commoditized that uh, title or that right or the flying time rights uh, and, and essentially commoditized that, sold that to investors. Um, and that became a Sharia, the first ever Sharia compliant sukuk for an airline that is the Emirates Airlines, which we all know of. Then you have the Nigerian Sovereign Sukuk, Ivory Coast Sukuk, and Bangladesh Water Sukuk. The latest one being the Bangladesh Water Sukuk that was issued by the Bangladesh Central Bank. So Sukuk has become an increasingly important aspect of uh, sovereign states seeking funding, especially from Muslim denominated countries, uh, from, the, from the OIC bloc, Organization of Islamic Conference bloc, etc. And if we look at the numbers when it comes to Sukuk funding, it is believed that the Sukuk funding reached approximately $148 billion uh, last year. And this year it is projected to reach somewhere around 167 to 175 billion United States dollars. And that number will only uh, increase. And we see that the, um, the take up of Sukuk uh, has increased tremendously where some of these sales are closed out in two, three hours in terms of the bond sales. So a huge opportunity for project promoters to seek funding via Sukuk, Sukuk mechanism or Islamic bond mechanisms. Uh, next slide. So, Let's quickly go through some of the, you know, the early history of, uh, of Islamic finance. So if you look at Islamic finance, uh, it was established during the prophetic era. You had the public uh, sector, you had the zakat, the Dubai Islamic Bank was established in 1974, 1975. And then you have the first suku that was issued by the Ottoman Empire in, in 1885. Uh, the Islamic capital market was instituted, that is, Sukuk, etc., was instituted between 1955 and 1974. And perhaps one of the earliest examples was the Mit Ghamar savings project in the Upper Nile area or the Upper Nile uh, River uh, in Egypt. And that Mit Ghamar savings project uh, was transformed into what is today known as the Faisal Bank of Egypt, which is a state owned bank which is wholly Islamic. Lastly, you have the Tabung Haji, which, was, uh, which is basically the central Hajj fund of the Malaysian state, where individuals pool their funds together for, for citizens or Malaysian citizens to then essentially uh, go for Hajj or the annual pilgrimage. So those who, who have been for the annual pilgrimage will know, or those who have visited uh, the Holy Lands of Mecca and Medina, they would know that uh, there are various buildings that have the, um, the name of Tabung Haji uh, on, on those buildings. So those are buildings that are owned by the Tabung Haji Waqf Fund that is, on the, that is premised on Islamic finance and economic principles. Um, next, next slide. 
So if you look at the development of Islamic finance here, as you can see, uh, you know, in the 1970s, you had retail banking, then you had commercial banking. And as you see in the contemporary 2000, you have much more advanced products like advanced treasury services, uh, the um, innovation in terms of asset management, but you had much more innovative products like, as I mentioned before, the cross-currency head swap, uh, et cetera. And today you have much more advanced products like the uh, Islamic ISDA Master Tahawut Agreement. You have the uh, Master Murabaha Facility Agreement for the uh, stock and for, for the stock sale and refinancing of stock uh, via a Murabaha uh, uh, Master Purchase Facility Agreement. So these are some of the uh, you know, innovative products that have been established. Uh, now going into the contemporary 2000s, 2010 to, to, to 2020. Uh, going forward, obviously, there is a huge opportunity for Islamic fintech uh, and the development of um, unique products such as Islamic crowdfunding, uh, etc. And uh, therein lies a massive opportunity for promoters of Islamic finance. If you look at the African content alone, uh, uh, close to 53% of the population are Muslim. And um, the take up of Islamic finance at a retail level it has a, is, is at a very minuscule scale. So a huge opportunity remains in terms of financial inclusion uh, from an Islamic finance perspective or from an Islamic economic perspective. And if individuals or promoters or companies could understand the nature of the opportunity, then that would be a huge, um, that would be a huge opportunity to, to develop and grow Islamic finance on the African continent, where, as I've said, it's believed that almost 53% of the population are Muslim. Next slide. Um, so if let's look at the sources of Islamic finance. It includes the Quran, the Sunnah, Ijma, and Qiyas. Now, these are Islamic terminologies. This is where uh, you have also the Ijtihad, where if we cannot find the ruling in these four primary sources, then we look at Ijtihad, where the scholars apply their mind in terms of reaching a uh, conclusion to a particular contemporary matter. Example of this would include uh, the prayer on the aeroplane. Now, during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, there was no aeroplanes. But now we have the aeroplane. So would it be permitted to pray on the aeroplane or not? Then that is the question. Uh, next slide. Um, now let's look at the Sharia structure. To look at the Sharia structure. Uh, you have the Quran and the Sunnah, which is the sources. Then you have the interpretation, which is the fiqh al-mu'amalat, the ijtihad, um, which as, as I mentioned, is the application or the modern application or contemporary application of the four primary sources of the Sharia to uh, contemporary issues. And then at the operation level, you have the Sharia board uh, and you have the mindset, et cetera, that needs to be compliant. So you have the Sharia supervisory board that will sit on an organization. So if, for example, you intend to issue an Islamic bond, then your bond, uh, if it is Sharia compliant, should have a Sharia board that will ensure that it is Sharia compliant. And they will also issue what is termed as the fatwa, or an Islamic legal edict that provides credibility to the, uh, to, to the structure. Uh, next slide. So let's look at the definition of Islamic finance and conventional finance. So uh, if you look at Islamic finance, it is Islamic banking that has been defined as banking in continence with the ethos and value system of Islam and governed by the principle and maxims laid down by classical Islamic Sharia law. So some of the fundamentals of Islamic finance include the fact that it has no intrinsic utility, uh, money has no intrinsic utility, and is a mere medium of exchange. So remember that money cannot, cannot make money. So this is one of the fundamental elements that has been defined by one of the famous scholars uh, called Sheikh Imam Ghazali Rahmatullahi, was one of the famous scholars. And he has mentioned that the money has no intrinsic utility itself. It is just a mere medium of exchange. Uh, when you look at the market regulation, that it is a free market economy based on divine guidance. So therefore, the sin industries would be removed from an Islamic free market economy. Uh, Islamic finance is governed by Sharia law and is essentially asset-backed financing. So it is not asset-linked financing, it is asset-backed financing. So this is uh, an important differentiation that when you look at the, uh, when you look at the, uh, you know, uh, conventional financing mechanism, you would find that generally it is asset-linked financing, it is not asset-backed financing. Uh, next slide. So. This is some of the requirements for, for Islamic finance. So as you can see, it is asset-backed. The transactions must be backed by tangible assets. There is a pro prohibition of, and the, of the payment and receipt of interest. Um, and if you look at the further requirements, 
you would note that there's a prohibition of activities, including uh, sin activities that are harmful to, to the society. There's a prohibition of halal uncertainty and may sale gambling, and there's profit and loss sharing where the bank act, acts as an agent or partner with the depositor who is entitled to share the gains and loss of the investment. So this is some of the fundamentals of Islamic finance here. Uh, next slide. So again, uh, these are some of the parameters of Islamic finance, as we've just mentioned previously. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Now, this is a snapshot of how an Islamic bank works. So as you can see, the depositors will pool their funds together in the Islamic bank. The shareholders also pool their funds. And the Islamic bank would then have a money market account, investment accounts, and financing. Now you have the depositors that would uh, essentially receive the funds via the Mudaraba, a profit sharing structure, or the Wadiya or trust, which is based on a uh, you know, loan or a trust that, it, that is deposited with the Islamic bank. So on the basis of a Wadiya or a trust, the depositors would then receive a gift in the form of a dividend from the Islamic bank, or if it is on the basis of Mudarabai, it will be a direct profit share in the form of a dividend that is declared to the depositors. If you look at the shareholders, the shareholders pool their funds, and the funds from the depositors and the shareholders are used to fund the investment accounts, financing activities of the Islamic bank. So essentially, that, that is the operational mechanism of an Islamic bank or an Islamic financial institution. Uh, next slide. So now let's go into some of the concepts of Islamic finance. Very quickly, I will touch upon them. The first is the musharaka or mudaraba, which is the equity based. Then you have the trading base, which is salam, istisna, and murabaha. And lastly, you have the lease base, which is ijara, 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 muntahiya, bitamlik, or ijara, bil, iqtina, uh, etc. In generally, in conventional finance, you have four forms of or four concepts. You have the equity based, you have the trading based, the lease based, and the debt based. Now, as I've mentioned before, that from an Islamic financial perspective, we don't trade debt. Beg or duyun is not permissible. To sell a debt is not permissible. Why? Because it then effectively relates or translates into the sale of money, which is not considered to be a commodity or an asset of value. As I mentioned, it is merely a medium of exchange. So, so to sell commercial paper for commercial paper, to sell an IOU for an IOU is not permitted because that is the sale of a debt or a sale of a debt in lieu of a debt. So to sell a debt in lieu of a debt, that is not permitted. So you have to sell an asset in exchange of, uh, in exchange of uh, money. So in that case, then we'll say that the money or the funds are being used as a medium of exchange to facilitate a valid Sharia compliant transaction. So this is the main concepts of Islamic finance. Now I will go through them very quickly. Uh, next slide. Now let's look at the musharaka. As you can see with the musharaka here, you have partner A that contributes to a venture, partner B contributes to a venture, and you have the loss that is based on the capital ratio. So if both the parties contributed an equal amount, one party cannot take a higher loss than the other party. If you look at the profit, Profit can be based on an agreed ratio. It could be 60-40, could be 50-50, etc. The one important point to note here is that if there is a sleeping partner in a musharaka, then the sleeping partner cannot get the sleeping partner cannot get a higher profit ratio than the capital contribution ratio. Um, so, so this is one one important point to note. When it comes to a musharaka, basically it is two or more partners contributing capital, either in cash or kind. The profit ratio has to be agreed up front, but it could be higher than the capital contribution ratio. But when it comes to losses, losses are based on the capital contribution ratio. So let's say, for example, partner A contributes 40% of the capital, then his loss will only be 40% of the loss. Now, the most important thing to remember of an Islamic business partnership is the hadith or the prophetic tradition which states, al bil In other words, that you can only make a profit based on your risk profile. So if you take a risk, then you will only make a profit based on the risk that you've taken. If you haven't taken any risk, then you cannot take any profit. Why? Because you have not taken the risk. 
and then that will be pure interest that you have received. So Sharia accords great importance to placing trust in the decree of the Almighty. If the Almighty agrees that you would get a profit, then he would allow for you to get a profit. But you cannot fix a profit because then that will be interest and that will be impermissible and riba. Uh, next slide. Now, modern application of musharaka, you have diminishing musharaka, which is used for home financing, project financing, import financing, uh, Islamic current account facilities, etc. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of a diminishing musharaka. As you can see, the bank purchases the asset with the eventual owner, and eventually the eventual owner purchases the asset over a period of time. Next slide. Now, mudaraba is the next concept which essentially refers to a sweat partnership where one party contributes the capital, the other party contributes the sweat or the work. Uh, next slide. So this is an example of a mudaraba. As you can see, the mudarib contributes to the venture, which is the working partner. The rabbul mal contributes capital. The profit is shared based on an agreed ratio, but all, when it comes to losses, all the monetary loss goes to the rabbul mal, whereas the loss of services is to the mudarib only or the sweat partner. Next slide. So what are some of the common products of Mudaraba? You have a private equity fund, deposit accounts, project financing, import financing, export financing, et cetera. Next slide. So as you can see with the Murabaha, you have the bank that purchases the goods and the goods are sold to the customer for a fixed sum over a term. This is what is termed as a Murabaha. Now Murabaha is perhaps one of the most commonly used concepts in Islamic finance. And basically it means where the cost price is known to the buyer also. Next slide. Next slide. Now, this is a snapshot of a Muraba. As you can see, the supplier sells the goods to the bank, the bank sells the goods to the client, and the client sells the goods to the end user or the end client. Now, the difference between Murabaha and a normal conventional loan is that in a Murabaha, there is an actual transaction taking place. Whereas in a conventional loan, it is simply an interest on a loan the bank loans the money to the client, the bank does not get involved in purchasing the goods. So when it comes to, when we talk of Islamic banking, we are actually referring to Islamic trading. It is not banking per se, where it is simply a loan or interest that is paid on a loan. So this is the difference between conventional and Islamic. One of the main differences perhaps also to enumerate here and to clarify is, let's say there are two chickens. One chicken is, has white feathers, the other chicken also has white feathers. But both are slaughtered, and that after they are slaughtered, their skin, they both look the same. They both look totally the same. Not that one is different and the other is different. But why is it that one is halal and the other is haram and impermissible? It's because the one, the name of God was taken out, and the other, the name of God was not taken out. So that is why one will be permitted, will be halal, will be sharia compliant, and the other won't be permitted. So likewise, Islamic finance is the exact same. Is that one concept would be sharia compliant, the other will not be Sharia. Why? Because there's a differentiation between the two concepts. On one side, the mechanism is compliant. And on the other side, the mechanism is not compliant. So this is an example of a Sharia compliant concept versus a non-Sharia concept. Next slide. So as you can see here, between conventional banking and Islamic banking, you see the amount financed, you see the Islamic banking. Now, on the Islamic banking side, you have the purchase price, and then you have the... <coughs> you have the, um, the tenure, the selling price. If you look at conventional bank, you have the amount finance, you have the interest rate. Then you've got the installments. And then you could also have variable rates. So Islamic banking is based on a purchase and selling price. Whereas conventional banking, as you can see, is based on an interest rate. So this now is the major difference between the two. Next slide. So the next concept is what is called the Ijara concept. Ijara refers to an Islamic leasing concept. As you can see that the uh, operating lease or financial lease is where the bank purchases the asset, leases it, leases, it, leases the asset to the client, and then the client purchases the asset at the end of the period. This could either be what is called Ijara Mutahiyah bi Tamlik, where the Ijara ends off with Tamlik or ownership by the client, or Ijara bil iktina, where at the end of the term, the bank simply sells the asset to the client for a fixed nominal sum. Or it could be what is called a spot ijara. Spot ijara refers to where 
the bank simply leases out the asset to the client and uh, the bank fully owns the asset and there is no intention to transfer ownership of that asset to the to the client so what what are some of the fundamentals of ijara so firstly is that in an ijara contract the daman the responsibility the the risk and responsibility of the asset remains with the bank and the financial institution in other words that if the asset is destroyed anything happens to the asset then the responsibility of that is on the bank and not the client unless it can be proven that there is what is called the adde fahish in other words that there is severe and adverse implications by the client over the asset in other words that the client deliberately destroyed or damaged the asset then in that case if that can be proven then in that case then the client will be responsible otherwise if let's say for example the the bank leases out a house to the client and the house automatically there is let's say what is called an act of what that the house collapses or one wall is damaged but it cannot be proven that the client or the lessee not the lessor the lessee did not damage the the house then in that case we'll say that th th this is now the responsibility of the bank so this is one of the fundamental rules of ijara secondly when it comes to ijara then a sub lease is, is not permitted unless it is done with the express intention of the lessor or the is the sub lease which is done on a different currency of the original lease or that the lessee has conducted major maintenance that will prove the that will prove the validity and justification for charging an extra rental so an example of this is let's say the bank leases the house to mr john john decides to sublease it out to mr mark john can only do that if he can prove that he has done such maintenance on or repairs to the house that will justify the extra rent or he could charge mark in a different currency than that than what the bank charged john in the first place so this is with regards to the issue of sublease thirdly is with regards to charging turnover rental the turnover rental is allowed it is permitted as long as there is a base and it is clearly acceptable as per the norm of the society next slide now this is an example of salam what is salam salam is an islamic forward sale where the bank would then forward purchase forward purchase the the goods from the producer and then on sell it on a parallel salam agreement to the final buyer this is what is termed as the salam financing transaction right uh, an example of this is the dubai islamic bank sugar salam financing product the, that is also sharia compliant now would that we move on to the next slide this is what is termed as takaful now takaful refers to islamic indemnification not islamic insurance and it is based on a mutual cooperative model Uh, we won't go into too much detail of the takaful and with that we would like to just explain the concept of sukuk and then terminate to move on to the q and a session so when we look at sukuk what is sukuk sukuk is an islamic bond or an islamic certificate that is backed by assets um the sukuk industry as i mentioned it is worth billions of dollars and there are various concepts of sukuk so sukuk you have a sukuk al ijara sukuk al salam sukuk al murabaha and different forms of sukuk transactions and when it comes to an islamic bond transaction very important to know three things the first is that there has to be a proper legal structure around the bond so a, a, a prospectus would have to be issued etc all of these documentation need to be sharia compliant also secondly is that you could have a listed and unlisted sukuk and generally we would advise that if it is a small issuance let's say 50 million dollars 100 million dollars and try to issue it in an unlisted private market third is that when it comes to sukuk funding uh, we at gifs have uh, global networks in terms of raising capital uh, via different institutions etc so you should also seek a global institution that has the right links to funding sources and mechanisms so that you can get your project funded 
Um, so this is a, a brief introduction to Sukuk, and uh, obviously ABIQ will make this presentation also available to you so that you can uh, gain more knowledge on Sukuk funding, uh, etc. So with that, we'd like to terminate this first part of this session and now open up the floor for Q&A. So we, will take, we can also take live questions uh, and we'll also take some of the questions that, uh, uh, that you have posed on the tab. With, with that, I now hand it over to uh, my good colleague, Mr. Emil, to um, take over. Thank you very much, uh, Ismail, for, for that. Very insightful. And yes, just to, to support uh, everybody that attended, we'll receive an email uh, tomorrow with the link to the video as well as the presentation to download. So yeah, it is uh, happy to share that. Um, I think we've got already one first question. Um, uh, specifically related to PPP projects and uh, you know how would you can you finance PPP projects so the, the public private partnership model um, you know obviously you guys can uh, GIFS can advise uh, and help with uh, raising capital for such projects and and sort of what is the jurisdictions as well as the type of infrastructure projects that that would you know typically PPP but would you would be able to be financed uh, on on a Islamic finance uh, basis. When it comes to uh, PPP projects, this is a, a very important uh, focus area for GIFS in that we have a multi-jurisdictional team uh, based in our three offices in South Africa, in Dubai, in Turkey, and in other jurisdictions, including in the UK, etc., where we are able to then bring together the expertise of not only Sharia experts, but also uh, legal professionals, tax professionals, accounting professionals, uh, and corporate bankers that would be able to put a suitable structure together uh, that it could stand up to the uh, global uh, financial um, and conventional capital markets uh, jurisdiction uh, regulations and, and, and legalities. So from that perspective, firstly, is that we are able to offer a multi-jurisdictional service. Secondly, is that from a funding perspective, are we able to do anything from $20 million up to $500 million? Uh, we generally conduct our capital raise on the basis of a syndicated model. So in other words, that we work with uh, global financial institutions, some of the largest names. Uh, we do understood and listed Sukuk. As I mentioned, is that if you have a, a minor amount, like let's say $50 million, then we prefer to do it as an unlisted uh, Sukuk. But nevertheless, you could also do it, uh, you could also do a listing once you have already uh, raised the capital, for example. The general process to raise capital via a Sharia compliant project uh, funding or, or PPP Sharia compliant PPP transaction is where you would have two mechanisms. One is you'd have the Sharia structuring piece or the structuring piece where the documentation will be put together like the prospectus, um, intercreditor agreements, etc. So, you know, those documents uh, are generally extremely costly. Uh, and if you go to a large legal firm, it could, it could cost you nothing uh, more than or nothing less than a million dollars at least. You know, we're talking of the largest names like Linklaters, uh, et cetera. Now, only the generally sovereigns would use these names. What we at GIFS have done is we have the templates. So we're able to offer you a much um, more affordable service, if, if, if I could say that, uh, but with the highest level of legal uh, and, and financial structuring credibility that could ever be out there. Because our members have worked for some of the largest uh, institutions, as I mentioned before. You know, we have members that have worked for JP Morgan. We have members that have worked here for Linklaters uh, and for various other institutions, including Dentons, which is the largest law firm. Uh, thirdly, is when it comes to the capital raising process, is we uh, have a, a specific roadshow to introduce the project to some of the world's greatest financial institutions. Um, and we already have these contacts introduce your, your projects uh, there, to, there to them. Now, one important point to note here is that because of the COVID pandemic, we are still able to conduct uh, our dealings because of the relationships that we have. Otherwise, to go and try to uh, you know, develop these relationships during a COVID-19 pandemic, when there are uh, you know, self-isolation, quarantine policies at major institutions will be extremely difficult. So this is in brief, uh, you know, an answer to your question around uh, GIFS's position on PPP projects. We've been very successful in what we do. We're one of the largest 
uh, you know, non-bank institutions uh, for um, infrastructure project and corporate finance, uh, you know, funding on the basis of uh, Islamic finance and economics. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on, that we've done over $8 billion worth of deal, deal advisory. Uh, so that's a, a brief answer to your question. Excellent. Thanks a lot, uh, Ismail. Uh, maybe just in terms of clarity, uh, into looking at sectors, uh, and rather than trying to list all the sectors you will invest in, what are the sectors that you won't or would not um, kind of look at on a PPP basis now? What would you not uh, invest in? So, I wonder if we've lost him there. So I mean, generally, so, sorry, I lost you there for a so, second. So I mean, so I mean, generally, yeah. So 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 I mean, generally, we wouldn't look at um, obviously the same industry as I mentioned because that won't be compliant. Uh, you know, we wouldn't look at uh, venture capital uh, because you know because of the risk profile. We wouldn't look at defense industries. Uh, we wouldn't look at. Um, anything which has some political connotation at, uh, attached to it. Mm -hmm. So as I said, generally the sectors we're looking at is infrastructure, hospitals, healthcare, uh, road road infrastructure, uh, software. Uh, I mean, we, we currently looking at a transaction uh, as an IPO, as, a, as an initial public offering uh, for a software uh, and technology solution that will be provided to a major government in Africa. Uh, so, so these are the type of projects we like to do, um, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, it's a matter of saying that, you know, if the proper agreements are signed, the offtake agreements are there that can serve as a as a guarantee, mm -hmm. and we can have proper, you know, uh, takaful cover, Islamic indemnification cover on these projects. Then that will serve as a good wrapper uh, for the institutional or our institutional investors to to look at those projects. Generally, you have, you know, the uh, pension funds, Sharia compliant equity funds that are looking at these projects in terms of investing in them. And if they're not well structured, if they're not well, um, you know, developed and not well researched and, 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 and analyzed from an economic and financial perspective, then it's extremely difficult to raise uh, capital for, for, for such projects. And generally what I, would, what I would like to say lastly is that, uh, you know, most of these projects that we take on, we generally seek advice from the investors first to say, Look, you know, this is a project that we've come come across. Would you guys be interested or not? Uh, if you are interested, at what level are you interested in? Uh, so we seek interest first before we go and do uh, a lot of the structuring uh, structuring work because it's important to understand what the market wants versus what they don't want. You know. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, maybe the, you know you touched a, a good point. What is what is the minimum requirements that needs to be in place for you to consider a project for finance? I mean, you talked about off taker agreements. Um, you know, insurance wrappers and stuff. Maybe just a bit more details about, you know, what is the minimum requirements? What what needs to be there before you look at it? Yeah, so so that's a very good question, Emil. And uh, let me answer this, and especially for those who intend to submit their projects. Mm -hmm. It's first you should have the minimum documentation requirements. So things like your KYC, uh, you know, um, offtake agreement. You know, you can't have. Uh, you know, a draft offtake agreement or an offtake on an, an offtake agreement with a uh, sort of a a, a quasi uh, you know entity uh, or a sub entity that doesn't have any backing. You know, if you have an offtake agreement with the government or the quasi uh, government entity that has some credibility, then that is something to consider. Then also, together with that, is you should be able to demonstrate you know, your financial and operational uh, track record and background regarding the project. Because the last thing you want to do is put, you know, a major project in your hands when you don't have the operational and financial and technical expertise to manage a project. Uh, and, and you don't have to do it yourself. You could have a third party that could demonstrate that via, you know, a proper EPC agreement or some form of a MOU or some form, form of a technical SLE, a service level agreement with that third party. Also, what I've generally noticed is that, um, you know, many projects are submitted with simply an MOU signed with a state government, etc. But the terms are not specifically defined. So that is very critical because when we pricing the bond, we pricing an issuance, then we need to ensure that there is price, pricing stability. Uh, mm -hmm. It can't be that, you know, today the price is X and tomorrow the price is Y, for example. So that's important. And generally, 
you know, we generally request our clients to take out, uh, you know, Islamic takaful indemnification policies that, that will serve as a wrapper against it. Because what happens is that that uh, Islamic, you know, indemnification or takaful policy is used uh, to then conduct a re takaful, um, you know, uh, um, a process uh, at the back end so that the institutional investors uh, are secure also from that perspective. Okay, very good. And what about, because um, there's something we also get asked quite often is about, you know, we have these new companies that's been kind of started up for specific projects. Uh, so the problem is there's no, you know, the parties involved might have a track record in terms of executing, but at least the legal entity themselves who's kind of applying might be a brand new entity. Is that something, is that the wrong approach? Uh, is that something to, that you can consider or what would you recommend um, companies in such a situation need to do? Well, definitely. So, I mean, generally most Sukuk issuances are done via an SPV and the rationale behind that is, is three, right? So mm -hmm. the first is that, uh, you know, it's not a requirement to have an SPV for Sukuk issuance. You could have a current entity that could also issue a Sukuk. But the rationale mm -hmm. behind that, number one, is that so that it is segregated so that it becomes a separate vehicle where the rights of the investors uh, are protected at the highest level. It mustn't mm -hmm. be that, you know, the Sukuk investors uh, have a second right to other existing, you know, uh, rights and liabilities and assets uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 in that one particular entity. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is that that structure that is set up is generally what is called a bankruptcy remote vehicle. So in other words, that it, the entity cannot simply be dissolved unilaterally by the promoters. Mm -hmm. It's something where the, you know, the, the investors, uh, you know, via the promoters now, uh, you know, appoint a third party. It'll be mm -hmm. like, a, a, you know, like a global auditor or, or a global agent that will then manage that entity. So it has specific rights and 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 um, and, and terms and conditions. Thirdly, mm -hmm. is that this was, the SPV is important from a tax neutrality perspective. So, so for example, if there is an issuance of let's say the Dubai government, they wouldn't generally issue that uh, via the Dubai government itself or via the jurisdiction of Dubai. Why? Because of two things. One is because. Uh, from a tax neutrality perspective, other investors from other jurisdictions generally might not even have a tax parity agreement between the um, between the Dubai government or the UAE okay. state and 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 their government or their state. For example, the US and the UAE government. Mm -hmm. So that's the first point. The second thing is then that. Um, you know, the investors also are seeking some form of tax parity and neutrality in the investment itself. Now, if they, for example, issue, um, if a bond is issued from the Dubai government, for example, now maybe there's not, um, you know, maybe there isn't tax parity uh, from where they are issuing the funds. So let's say if the funds, if the bond is issued from, let's say, Jersey, for example, which has become a known entity for issuance, for issuance of Suku, then in that case, for example, uh, there are certain uh, your tax benefits for investing in, 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 in a place like Jersey, for example. So those are some of the considerations. It's not a requirement to have an SPV, but generally we prefer to have an SPV. Now the SPV could take, generally takes the form of a trust, trust fund structure because a trust fund structure would then, pro would then um, provide uh, you know, specific rights to creditors being the investors as opposed to a normal company structure, for example. So these are all the considerations that need to be considered. And generally, you know, we have legal advisors uh, that will make sure that the rights of the investors are protected. Because the last thing we have is people invest in, in Sukuk and then they say, you know, that, the, the, you know, you know, the, the uh, promoters are defaulting on this uh, Sukuk transaction. How do yeah. we resolve it, et cetera? And the rights of the investors are not protected. So our main practical aspect of the issuance of Sukuk is to ensure that both parties are protected. Whether it's an yeah. investor, whether whether it's the, it's a promoter also. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're gonna take one more question quickly. Yeah. With with, um, or maybe a, a brief one. Yes. Is the good capital um, cheaper than conventional debt from traditional banks? Look, that's a very good question. I mean, generally, you know, school capital is in line with conventional debt, uh, depending on the jurisdictions. 
uh, or, or, or cheaper. Now, okay. if you're talking of debt issued in Europe, then obviously Sunku capital will be more expensive because you know uh, you have <laughs> you have z- you have zero interest, and sometimes you will end mm-hmm. up paying the bank to keep your money. Right? Yeah. But generally, yeah. you find like uh, when it comes to pricing, for example, of certain Sunku bonds, uh, Emirates Islamic issued a bond last year that was uh, priced at. Uh, uh, 1.8, 1.80 percent, 180 uh, books. Yeah. So, so the pricing generally differs on jurisdiction to, to jurisdiction. I mean, generally it's in line with with, with conventional norm. Uh, mm-hmm. But because there is a huge lack of suitable instruments, you mm-hmm. could have uh, much more bids, uh, price bids, in fact, on your or offers on your mm-hmm. issuance. Um, mm-hmm. So I know that various issuances that we were involved in in the past, as I mentioned. Within one to two hours, a couple of phone calls and you know billion dollars was 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 already subscribed. Yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, we've come run out of time. It's three o'clock. Um, Ismail, thank you very much as always for your participation and your insights. We've got a couple more questions that came through, which I think we will address via email. Um, and then uh, yeah, hope to see you again soon on one of our next uh, webinars. And uh, all the best. Thank you very much to everyone that's attended as well. Perfect. Thank you very much, Emil. And I would like to also extend my uh, gratitude and uh, thanks for all the participants for attending this program. I believe that uh, ABIQ will share a presentation with you and uh, a recording will be probably uploaded. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to ABIQ. And you can also reach us to, to, uh, to Global Islamic Financial Services at www.gifsrb.com. Our email address is admin at gif srv.com. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.